Good morning. Uh, my name is Canon Scott Holcomb. I am the Canon to the Ordinary for the Diocese of Central Florida. And uh, welcome to Vestry Training Part 2. Um, throughout this uh, presentation, um, uh, you will be able to use uh, the chat feature uh, to ask any questions that you may have. And um, please feel free uh, to do so. Um, the Zoom link um, for this meeting uh, is as follows. Um, you obviously found that or you would not um, be on this call. Um, today, um, we will be dealing with uh, predominantly uh, three subjects. Uh, number one, everyone's favorite, uh, dealing with rector vestry conflict. Uh, the second part will be clergy compensation and benefits. And the third part will be uh, as we begin to think about uh, the road to recovery after COVID, uh, what that's going to look like, um, what uh, future studies people are saying, and uh, things that we should be doing now uh, to get ready for that. Um, for those of you, uh, most of us are used to this um, with frequent Zoom meetings, uh, but please keep your microphone muted unless you've been recognized by the speaker. Um, you can do that uh, in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. If there's a red slash uh, across the microphone, then you're already muted. Uh, but if not, just go ahead and tap on that uh, microphone icon and it will mute um, your computer or phone or tablet. Uh, so background noise isn't coming through to the rest of the presentation. Um, if you have a question, again, at the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll notice there's a little chat button. Uh, you can click that and a screen will come up and you can type uh, in your question or comments. Um, also on this um, Zoom training, uh, Eric Perez um, uh, at the diocesan office is available. Uh, if you have any technical questions about Zoom or you can't hear or whatever, um, you can email Eric uh, eperez at cfdiocese.org um, and he is there and can answer your question either by text or um, by email. Um, this is me. Uh, I have been on diocesan staff uh, since October 1st of 2019. I uh, have served at rector of six different congregations and an assistant twice. So um, I've been around a long time and uh, uh, can speak to these subjects with uh, some degree of familiarity. Um, let us pray. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, we know that when two or three gather together in your name, you will be in the midst of them and so will conflict. We know from scripture and our own experience that we can disagree about anything from money management to institutional priorities, from who gets credit for victory to who gets blamed for failure. Power and money are especially difficult for us. Help us to manage our conflicts wisely with more attention to fact than to rumor, with more desire to listen than to prevail with open hearts and not closed minds. All this we ask in the name of one who was never fully understood, never fully accepted, 
never fully heard. Our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, the prayers that we will use at the beginning and end are from the Vestry Resource Guide, and they have great uh, prayers uh, for each month appropriate to what your vestry should be doing, and uh, you may want to check those out. Uh, I think this cartoon says it all. Uh, churches in crisis, uh, next 2,700 miles. I do want to point out an uh, interesting little fact. Uh, you notice uh, the word crisis. Um, when we think about crisis in uh, English, um, in the English language, we usually think about it in terms of, oh my gosh, the world's falling apart, the church is going to die or close, uh, usually evokes a, a very visceral uh, feeling, emotional response in us, and um, uh, whips everybody into a frenzy. Uh, curiously, um, in the Greek language, uh, the word pronounced exactly the same uh, starts with a kappa, a K, instead of a C, but has a very different meaning. Uh, crisis um, in the Greek language means that you have simply come to a point of decision that you need to make as unemotionally and logically as possible. Usually when there's a crisis, what it means is there's really a decision that needs to be made. It may not be a popular one. It may be a costly one, um, but there's some sort of decision that needs to be made. So uh, next time you find yourself uh, feeling a, a little tense, a little emotional, uh, when you're getting to a point of decision, um, reflect on this and I think it may guide you uh, to a very different place. I do want to begin this uh, training uh, with a word from our sponsor, um, from the scripture, uh, dealing with conflict according to Matthew 18, uh, has uh, three um, very orderly steps. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, then you have gained your brother. Notice the first step, when there's conflict, when there's sin, when there's trouble, try and work it out between just two parties. The second, uh, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So um, if, if just one to one doesn't work out, um, if there are some other people uh, nearby uh, who are logical, uh, rational, perhaps who have something to speak into this conflict or this situation, um, bring those people in if you've, you've not been able to work it out one by one. And then, of course, step three, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Um, you know, there may be a need to protect the church uh, by sharing select information with the larger body. Um, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Um, enough said. Um, what is conflict? Um, pulled up a couple of different uh, definitions and uh, comments. Comment it, conflict is an active disagreement between people with opposing opinions or principles. Or another working definition, it's a deliberate attempt to oppose, resist, or coerce the will of another or others. Or a third definition, 
It's a process of seeking to obtain rewards by eliminating or weakening the competitors. Conflict is the antithesis of cooperation. According to Daniel uh, Katz, a social psychologist at the University of Michigan, conflict arises primarily due to one of these three things. It can be, there's an economic conflict and who hasn't dealt with that in the church when there's uh, too much month at the end of the money or when uh, there is a passion to appeal uh, to do something that uh, is not within the confines of the church budget um, or uh, an employee or the clergy uh, want or need a raise uh, and the church is not able to um, respond favorably. Uh, another root cause of conflict, uh, values conflict. Uh, this comes about uh, by way of varied preferences or ideologies or beliefs that they often assert. Um, you need an example, uh, attend any worship committee, uh, bring up the subject of music, uh, of guitars or drums in worship, uh, the benefits of right one or right two, um, what the service schedule should be. Um, I uh, made a, a very uh, interesting mistake only once, uh, but vowed to never do it again. Um, we were thinking about uh, painting uh, the church, uh, one of multiple colors, and uh, we painted three samples on the wall and and ask people to uh, give their opinion or vote uh, for which uh, we thought was the best color. Um, it did not turn out well. Um, so um, we have different values, um, different preferences, uh, different styles or ideologies, and uh, those certainly come into uh, tension uh, in the church environment. And who hasn't been in a, a wonderful situation in the church when there is a power conflict? Um, a few uh, great examples of this is um, in dealing with a church recently, uh, someone was elected to the vestry and they felt that um, that gave them the right to uh, bully other people um, by beginning every sentence. Um, with, well, I'm on the vestry and I think, or I'm on the vestry, so this should happen. Uh, even though the vestry had never voted or perhaps even discussed uh, the matter that uh, this individual was speaking about. Uh, power conflicts also occur uh, when the rector and the vestry um, are sure uh, that they are in charge. Um, uh, you don't have to look or live far in the church to see various examples of power conflicts or something that has um, uh, come into use uh, in recent years. Uh, we often refer to individuals who are exerting such power um, as power silos. Um, so if you hear that term, uh, connect it to this thought. Uh, there are three primary ways of dealing with conflict. Uh, we can avoid it, uh, resolve it, uh, or manage it. Um, there are actually uh, psychological tests that you can take uh, to give you a percentage of, of your uh, primary responses uh, in various situations. When we think about it in terms of a vestry rector conflict, we need to keep in mind that we're not coming into the situation uh, with a blank slate. Uh, we bring a history. Um, if the vestry um, has a habit of, um, uh, you know, 
burning the midnight oil and we're not leaving here till we resolve this conflict and they feel every conflict has to be resolved, um, you're gonna have some long vestry meetings. Um, each time new people are elected to the vestry, there's gonna be some jostling around. Uh, different individuals will exert their um, uh, preferences on the larger body. And you just need to be mindful that perhaps you have had maybe uh, what some people call a rubber stamp vestry, where the rector just, you know, vestry meetings are an hour and a half report of what the rector tells us or what he or she wants us to do. And uh, the vestry is expected just to uh, accept it and uh, not uh, uh, challenge any of the rector's decisions. Um, there could be a past history or DNA that there either was a, a massively explosive conflict in the church and people are now fearful to go there uh, to, to deal with any conflict. So the vestry may have a, an identity that is, is very conflict averse or you know, they avoid conflict at all costs. Um, um, there may be some vestries who don't want to make a decision about anything and they're perfectly okay with holding things in tension. And uh, we're not going to decide what color we're going to paint the, the women's bathroom because you know, um, if we paint it this color, these people will be upset. If we paint it that color, you know, those people will be upset. And so um, we're just not going to make a decision. Uh, that could be avoidance, but that could also be the way that the vestry has learned how to deal with conflict. They just are going to manage it. They're just going to keep it in that um, state of flux or tension uh, that can be very aggravating to those who want to resolve conflict. Um, this is also um, true of the clergy. Um, there are clergy who uh, basic style of operation is uh, um, they just want everything to be nice and avoid conflict at all costs and you know whatever you say or uh, a, a really uh, painful example of conflict avoidance is uh, clergy who give one answer to one group uh, when they're with, um, let's say, group A, and then they go to group B, which is maybe a men's group or a, a different group, and uh, they give a completely different answer. Uh, that can be very frustrating uh, for the congregation but that could be the way that that rector or clergy has learned to deal with conflict. Um, it's not that they're wishy-washy. Uh, perhaps when they're with that group, that's actually how they feel. Uh, but it could be that that's their um, go-to tool for dealing with conflict. Um, there are also clergy, obviously, who want to get to the bottom of every problem, resolve every conflict. And uh, for those who are comfortable on the vestry with, um, uh, you know, we don't have to make that decision tonight. We can, we can talk to people in the congregation and get their input and uh, whatever. Uh, you're going to see conflict um, uh, spring up if the, rector or the clergy and the vestry have very different styles of dealing with conflict. Um, but before we can really even begin to address conflict, uh, there needs to be some sort of assessment, uh, analysis, diagnosis. What's really going on here? because as we all know, uh, the stated conflict is not always the root cause of the conflict. Some questions to ask yourself is, when did this conflict really start? Um, 
did this conflict start uh, because we got a new rector who prefers right to, or are there some people who are still angry uh, that we adopted the 1979 prayer book? Um, we have to stop and, and really ask uh, a lot of basic questions if we're going to you know, truly work through this conflict. When did it start? Who were the contributors? Uh, as we all know, there are people that when you get to times of conflict, uh, they bring a bucket of water and there are other people who bring a bucket of gasoline um, and uh, are standing with a, a match already lit. Um, who, who has contributed um, to this, this matter, this situation? Um, it's actually helpful to, to sit down and, and maybe even make a list of, of who the contributors are uh, on both sides. Um, third point of assessing conflict, um, do I have the data I need? Do I have maybe not all of it, maybe most of it, uh, but again, uh, even if you're not a list maker, you need to do it in these situations. Uh, do I have all the data I need, uh, pro and con? Um, if you're truly assessing conflict um, accurately, um, you can't let individuals or groups say, they said, or this group, okay? Actually, if you're gonna look at assessing or analyzing conflict and trying to figure out what the best way to deal with it, you have to be specific. Um, I heard Jane say X in an email I got from Mark, he said this, okay. If you're going to assess the data, it has to be specific. Um, Point number four, uh, who is the best or most qualified person to address it? Um, we all know this um, from uh, stewardship training. That is, it's not just enough to have an every member canvas, um, but most canvases are set up where people of like mind are actually the people who request gifts from like givers. Um, who is the best or most qualified person to address the conflict? In some situations, it's the rector. In some situations, it may be the senior or junior warden. Um, in some cases, uh, in an escalated conflict, um, it may be um, the bishop, the bishop's designee, which is usually uh, the canon to the ordinary, or there are times <clears throat> when the bishop uh, asks other uh, qualified individuals to step in and uh, be the moderator um, or mediator uh, to try and deal with the situation. Um, number five, um, is this the right time to deal with this conflict? Um, if you were to do a chart of conflict avoidant vestries, you would discover that um, the nuclear decisions, uh, we tend to want to move to the end of the meeting. When people are tired, uh, when they're ready to go home, um, when, they're, when their fighter is, is uh, done at the end of the day. Um, how you make your vestry agenda may often um, actually accentuate um, how much conflict you have at your vestry meetings. Um, for example, in vestry training one, I gave you a uh, suggested outline for how vestry meetings uh, are to be conducted, to be most productive. Um, you don't start out with dealing with minutes and financial reports. Um, those are at the tail end of the agenda uh, because for the most part, people may not have even read them 
even though you sent them out ahead. Um, if you want to get the, the most bang for the buck um, in your vestry meetings, um, try at the very beginning, if you don't have a pre-determined uh, agenda, which I think is um, unexcusable, um, but if you don't, um, uh, begin with um, this question. What are the top four or five matters that we need to discuss or make a decision about tonight? List them on a piece of um, a chart or a newsprint. There's your agenda. Deal with what's hot on people's mind when they're the least tired, when they're most actively engaged. And you'll see by moving the tough discussions and decisions to the front part of the agenda uh, makes it um, much easier and more productive in your vestry discussion. Um, it's not just the right time of the meeting, but also to, to ask the question, um, gee, it's Holy Week, let's have a big fight. Um, or, gee, uh, the rector has just dealt with uh, several very emotional and traumatic deaths of uh, parishioners that she or he was very close to. Yep, let's rip off the scab of this wound and, and you know, deal with this conflict uh, two days after the last funeral. Um, Think about what's going on in the life of the congregation, in the life of the clergy, uh, even in individual vestry persons. And uh, you may realize that you're not just running from conflict, but we need to determine when's the right time to deal with something. Um, it's also uh, very helpful uh, before you get into dealing with the conflict um, what do I really hope to accomplish in this process? Um, do you want somebody to resign? Uh, do you want somebody to, li to leave? Um, do you just want to make sure they understand your perspective? Um, what is it specifically that you hope to accomplish in dealing with this conflict? Um, do you want to win? Um, do you want the other person to lose? Uh, do you just want to vent? Um, what are your specific hopes that you wish to accomplish? And then also, um, and yes, even before you start dealing with this, um, imagine what would things look like around here if this conflict was resolved? Would you just move on to another heated conflict? Um, there are some churches that, that actually do that. They just move from massive conflict to massive conflict. Uh, the, the front door of the church is like a revolving door in a big hotel. And uh, that's a part of their DNA. Ask yourself the really hard question. If this conflict were resolved, what would that look like? How are the people who win going to deal with it? Um, you know, are they going to gloat over their win? Um, uh, are they going to rejoice that other people lost and, and, and were hurt or perhaps left the church? Um, you, can, you can get to a lot of... Um, very interesting data. Um, if you will just have this kind of sheet, and even if you don't do the, the exercise in writing, uh, if you have this sheet uh, in the front of your vestry notebook, um, uh, I think it may save you um, a, lot of, a lot of pain. Um, in looking at um, those five main sources of conflict, uh, let's look at some examples, especially 
uh, on the vestry rector level. Uh, if there are personal differences, uh, these could be different expectations. Uh, I can't tell you how many times in dealing um, with vestries that I discover that um, there were different expectations of the clergy uh, going all the way back to the search process. Um, you know, the vestry may feel that a candidate wasn't honest or a clergy person may feel that the search committee in the vestry didn't really paint an accurate picture uh, of the congregation. Um, the personal differences uh, can be in terms of perceptions or values or beliefs. Um, all, any of these kind of personal uh, differences um, is gonna make uh, a, a quick and easy resolution uh, much more difficult. Um, you can have conflicting objectives. You know, uh, I want right to at all services. Uh, gee, um, what about the right one people? Um, well, there's not many of them left. They're all going to be dead in a few years anyway. Uh, let's move ahead. Let's, let's present a unified front in our worship. Um, you know, a part of the reason that there are so many conflicting objectives specifically around the subject of worship and music and liturgy and even the preferred Bible translation um, is that uh, I think, uh, especially about that subject, um, we seldom ask uh, what kind of worship does God want? Um, you may wanna do a Bible study with your vestry on that subject. And I think you would be surprised that uh, none of the concerns of the flesh in terms of uh, our personal preferences uh, really uh, have a scriptural warrant. Um, one of the main sources of conflict is, is often uh, different groups have different information or a lack of, of information. It can be bad information. Um, you know, woe be the individual um, uh, on the vestry who spends 10 minutes before the vestry meeting uh, Googling whatever the problem is. Um, you know, this could be misinformation, uh, misrepresentation, or uh, miscommunication. Um, another source of conflict is role incompatibility. Uh, people's goals and responsibilities uh, don't align with their expectation of values. Uh, again, uh, if you're dealing with an individual uh, who has been, uh, before they were a clergy person, uh, they were in the business world, and uh, every year that they knew that they were going to have a, a performance review, and their um, compensation was going to be based on uh, their productivity um, or lack of productivity. Um, uh, you get into um, uh, a church environment and, you know, these individuals who are now clergy um, rarely see uh, any kind of performance review uh, and they see the budget just go along year after year after year without, uh, in some cases, even a cost of living adjustment, uh, you're going to see that there are people who have a very different uh, sense of expectation. And also another form of, or source of conflict is uh, environmental conflict. What's contributing to this? Uh, and I don't just mean like our ecological environment, but this can be uh, lack of resources, um, uh, especially in a church with a tight budget or uh, even worse, um, a deficit budget. Um, you will see that there are, are plays uh, to uh, attempt to win um, support for uh, certain pet peeves um, in ministry. Um, 
all of these can contribute uh, greatly uh, to the um, vestry clergy conflict. Um, again, some very specific examples, um, personal differences. Um, you know, there are some um, individuals on the vestry or in the church who feel that by golly, the rector should have office hours and the rector should um, uh, publish them and keep them. And, you know, they, they have a list of expectations a mile long. Uh, they want their, their minister to have office hours, but they also want them to make pastoral visits to homebound and hospitals. Um, uh, you know, if, if you stop by one time and the rector's not in the office, um, of course you didn't make an appointment. Uh, but again, you know, I was there during your regular office hours and, and you weren't there, okay? the conflict is not about whether or not the rector um, is there at the, that time. There's a much deeper uh, personal difference uh, that's going on. Um, a good example of conflicting objectives um, in the uh, ordination service, uh, as well as in the vows that clergy take um, there's an expectation uh, that they are going to be in the, involved in the larger church beyond just the local congregation. Uh, there are some people who enjoy being on diocesan board or standing committee or different uh, diocesan or regional committees or even ecumenical boards or bodies. Um, this involves travel. Um, but if, if you have a really tight budget and the, the treasurer or someone on the, on the vestry who's monitoring the, the mileage costs for the clergy and, you know, gee, you, you're gone X number of hours every month because you're involved in all this other stuff away from here. Um, well, you can pretty much boil that down to, um, vestry and clergy having very different objectives in terms of how they approach um, their ministries. Uh, lack of information, uh, be in a church uh, with a, a secretary or a parish administrator who's going through some difficult personal times in their life and they, they may be rattled when they're uh, doing the budget are doing the, the bulletin every week and uh, the Sunday bulletin's wrong week after week after week, um, you will discover that there will be conflict that will come about. Uh, role in compatibility. Um, one of the primo examples is uh, in someone's um, uh, uh, parish profile uh, during the search, their OTM said they were they were a stewardship leader and and they had, you know, really turned their last church around and the pledges had increased by so many percent. And uh, now we call you to be our rector and uh, we don't see you doing that there, here. Um, that's your fault. Well, not necessarily. It could be a very immature, spiritually immature congregation. Uh, it could be there's been no stewardship teaching. Uh, it may be that, you know, there's a DNA of $5 a week Episcopalians uh, who are a part of the congregation. But it's typically borne out in role in compatibility. Uh, and then of course, a great example of an environmental conflict um, is when people just don't address painful subjects. People see the budget static or in slight decline year after year after year. And so nobody says anything about the, the clergy part of the budget. They just skip over it. Um, you know, 
the rector certainly knows they're not getting a raise year after year. Um, but, you know, if the rector is not going to bring the subject up, not necessarily at a vestry meeting, although I think that's appropriate, but definitely at a finance committee meeting or whoever is creating the budget, um, you will see environmental conflict uh, rear its ugly head. Um, what are the type of things that uh, most often generate uh, clergy vestry conflicts? Um, so far in my experience as um, uh, canon to the ordinary in the diocese, um, these have been uh, some of the situations that I have had to deal with. Um, uh, letter of agreement disagreements. Um, differing perspectives about the rector's job responsibilities. Um, we all know how difficult it is uh, to come up with a rector's job description. And so some clergy and vestries just don't ever do it. Um, as difficult a task as that is, uh, it can be a very productive um, conversation. Um, when the vestry and the clergy have different expectations about staff and staff accountability. Whether that's the clergy staff or the lay staff doesn't make any difference. Um, if you have someone in the vestry who's a really close friend of one of the staff members, you can expect they're gonna be very protective um, when any discussion of that individual comes up on the vestry. Uh, clergy vestry conflicts, Utah clergy salaries or benefits, uh, you will find them come out of the woodwork. Especially if the rector or clergy have not, or lay staff have not had a raise, either merit or even a cost of living adjustment. Um, clergy vestry, vestry conflicts, you hire a rector who really um, is passionate about this degree, uh, um, this perspective of ministry, or gee, you know, we're going to hire you and we really want you to come and launch this program or that program. And they're all excited and they get to the congregation and there's uh, no money in the budget. Um, for uh, launching new uh, ministries or ideas. Um, you will see conflict. Um, when vestry and search committees are not honest with each other. Um, just ask anyone, whether vestry or member of the parish, um, what do you think father or mother so-and-so spends too much time in or too much time with? Uh, you will see the coals, the embers of what will soon be your next forest fire. Um, clergy are operating outside their gifting or bandwidth. Um, let me give you uh, an example of that. Um, let's say that you hire a um, uh, clergy person who has maybe only been out of seminary a few years. They might have been an assistant in their former parish um, and uh, they're ready to kind of, uh, you know, test out their wings and, and see what this being a rector's like because, you know, they've been an assistant for a couple of years. So now they really know everything and they move into a parish um, that typically has had a more seasoned person there. Um, and they expect that the clergy are going to know things or do things like their former rector did. Um, but that may not be the interest or gift or skills or abilities um, of the next clergy person. Um, you might want to start uh, looking around for uh, armor because um, there's a battle coming. Um, 
some on the vestry uh, or in the church want the rector removed, uh, but don't know how to initiate that discussion. Uh, so they just become antagonists and, and pick things apart. Um, uh, clergy, uh, whenever they see this, um, uh, next one, the sheep are attacking. Um, I wanna give uh, due um, regard uh, to the Reverend Dennis Maynard's book, uh, When Sheep Attack. Um, if uh, your church has gone through uh, or is going through really a time of difficult conflict, or there's been a history of long, unsustained, uh, unresolved conflict in a congregation, um, many clergy will know about uh, Dennis Maynard's book, uh, When Sheep Attack, and, and um, it actually can be a very constructive exercise if led by an outsider to actually have the vestry and clergy study this book and each month take 10 or 15 minutes to discuss the thoughts in each chapter. Um, that book is readily available. It's 10 or 15 bucks, um, but it may be the best money that uh, your church spends this year. Um, clergy conflicts happen when vestry don't support the clergy. Um, you, you make a decision, uh, you um, uh, get out in the congregation, in the parish hall, it's coffee hour on Sunday morning. Uh, somebody reads a, a summary of the vestry actions the last month, and you say, well, you know, I really wasn't supportive of that, but everybody else was voting for it, so I did. Um, when the vestry don't support the clergy or the decisions that the vestry has made as though they voted for them, um, you will have conflict. If there's a decline in attendance, giving, or program, or participation, you know that's always the rector's fault. I hope you can look at COVID and see that not everything is the rector's fault. Um, clergy and vestry are unrealistic in their expectations of each other. Um, vestry who have had conflict with past clergy tend to repeat. Um, uh, I was in a congregation that had um, uh, involuntarily terminated several previous rectors, uh, happened to me as well. And, uh, you know, in my discussion with the bishop um, as I was leaving the diocese, it's like, you know, you really should have expected this because that's just the way they are. Um, clergy who have had uh, conflicts with past vestries, um, you can maybe see a little bit of transference. And, you know, if they had difficulty with their previous vestry, um, um, maybe that's their mode of operation. I think an excellent question that all search committees should ask their clergy is, you know, how do you deal with conflict during the interview? Can you give us some examples of, of how, you know, you have handled conflict? Um, and, you know, what is, would you please describe your relationship with your vestry? You know, if the clergy say, uh, they're my, my strongest supporters, uh, that's going to tell you something. Um, if, if the clergy hint that they, they dread going to vestry meetings and all they do is fight and, you know, they're ready for a, a, a new, a new challenge. Mm, warning, Will Robinson, danger, danger. Um, Many times people just don't want to see the truth. And um, uh, one of the biggest contributing causes, um, I feel, 
are um, not having uh, mutual ministry reviews. Um, in every clergy person's letter of agreement in the Diocese of Central Florida, between months seven and 11, um, usually I come in to the congregation to assist in this mutual ministry review process. Again, it's a very orderly process. We start out, uh, we look at search, um, uh, what were the search materials used um, when you interviewed and, and when you came and were a candidate um, uh, for this position. Um, and there's discussion between the rector and the vestry. Um, did this adequately represent uh, who I see you are? Um, or, you know, was there a misrepresentation or God forbid, an intentional hiding of information. Um, the mutual ministry review is a time to look back at the kind of courting candidating period while the person was interviewing. And, um, you know, the goal there is to hopefully get that the director um, uh, adequately uh, understood what they were getting into and feel that the, the vestry and search committee were um, adequately disclosing about the strengths and the weaknesses of the congregation, um, or um, that uh, they did not uh, adequately represent, and that's caused some, some major angst um, uh, within the clergy. Um, the second part, um, of the um, mutual ministry review is an opportunity for the vestry to give input to the rector about how they see their job performance um, over the past seven to 11 months, realizing, of course, that you are in the honeymoon period. Um, the third part of the mutual ministry review is for the rector to give input to the vestry about um, uh, his impressions of the vestry and uh, their uh, either assistance or blocking in what he or she is trying to do. Um, if, if the clergy feel that the vestry are all talk and no action or support, um, that needs to be spoken. Um, and then the fourth part of the mutual ministry review is in light of these first three components, um, what are our goals for the coming year? What are the specifics that we really wanna work on coming out of this that um, we can establish some concrete goals with some um, measurable criteria uh, to move forward. Um, that's what happens at the end of, of everyone's first year. And um, congregations that, or clergy, who do take this um, um, seriously, many of them say, gee, that was really helpful. Uh, we're gonna do this every year because it gives us something very constructive. As the vestry gets new people, uh, it gives a time for feedback and feed forward. Um, show me a church in conflict and ma major conflict, and I'll show you a church that hasn't done a mutual ministry review in a long time. Um, So we've, we've looked at conflict, some of its um, danger points, uh, things to look for. Uh, what are some things that we can do to actually reduce conflict um, from between clergy and vestry? Um, obviously, number one on my list is to have an, at, an annual mutual ministry review 
that ends with clarifying goals and expectations of both the clergy and the vestry. Uh, number two, every once in a while, dust out, the, bring out that old letter of agreement, shake the dust or the cobwebs off and read it together during a vestry meeting. Um, you know, this is what happened, you know, three years ago when you signed the contract. Um, does any of this need to be uh, addressed or changed? Um, is our, our working relationship healthy or do we need to uh, build in some safeguards? You can always revise that letter of agreement, not just the salary portion, but other portions of it. Uh, just Vestry, please keep in mind, this has to be done between the rector, the vestry, and the bishop has to sign it before it is actually in force. So if you are gonna redo your letter of agreement, just uh, send it to the bishop for his signature once you get it, uh, your, your work done. Um, you wanna reduce conflict, uh, review the compensation regularly and look at the benefits of similar size congregation, similar clergy with about the same amount of experience and uh, evaluate, you know, are our clergy um, adequately compensated? Uh, if you have any question about that, um, if you will contact me, um, just shoot me an email and say, hey, Kenneth Scott, would you uh, give us a, a brief synopsis of um, what rectors um, or assistants in similar sized churches and congregations, uh, what their compensation package is. Um, I will be happy to do that for you. Uh, Want to reduce conflict? Uh, make sure your clergy are taking their regular days off. Um, if they have an incredibly hectic schedule, uh, if they have a, a bunch of funerals or weddings that, that are filling up their normal days off, make sure that they're taking uh, compensatory time off, uh, even if it's in the middle of the week. Um, are they taking their vacation? Um, do they have adequate resources to be able to take a vacation? Uh, if not, and if you can't afford, um, uh, uh, you know, to give them uh, a salary increase, um, have individual vestry members talk around to people in the congregation who may have a a second home or a, a vacation home um, and uh, try and encourage them to um, donate uh, a week's use to the rector and his or her family uh, so they can get away without um, busting their budget. Um, are the clergy taking good care of themselves physically, spiritually? Um, vestry. Um, have you asked the clergy um, anything about their spiritual life lately? Um, you know, uh, father, mother, um, how's your prayer life? Um, you know, do you have a do you have a confessor or or spiritual um, guide or mentor? Um, when's the last time you made a retreat? Um, these are not intrusive questions. Uh, these are questions that most clergy will actually appreciate um, and maybe uh, be the leverage that they need um, to take time uh, for themselves. Another conflict reducer, uh, it's not who's right or wrong or who wins. Um, the goal of conflict resolution is always to restore the relationship. Even if you disagree, even if you think the other person is dead wrong, are you working day by day, week by week, month by month to restore the relationship? Um, 
in certain levels of conflict, and we're going to talk about those in just a moment. Um, if conflict is longstanding, lopsided, intractable, um, you may need to bring in a third party or outside mediator um, to assist. Um, an important piece, um, we do deal with conflict in a theological um, from a theological perspective, and that is, um, you know, if, if the conflict is getting worked on or resolved, you know, is, is there some degree of forgiveness um, that needs to be um, offered? Um, you know, forgiveness could be in the form of, you know, I'm sorry. It could be in the form of, you know, gee, I, I promise I'm not going to do this again. Uh, forgiveness could be in the in the form of, um, you know, um, we're not going to uh, bring this subject up again. That's going to be my gift to you. Um, what would forgiveness look like? And is someone adequately assessing um, if forgiveness is needed? And of course, um, great conflict reducer uh, is when you see it coming, uh, call me or call the bishop or, or call, you know, a, a respected third party uh, and bring them in to uh, help mediate. Don't wait until it's, it's vicious and, and, you know, you're ready to rip limb from limb, um, but bring, uh, outside help in uh, at the beginning. Um, um, I'm not going to talk a, a great deal about this. Um, we are going to be looking at some other ways to specifically address conflict, but I wanted you to have this in your notes. Um, this is a very reputable um, uh, group that have uh, do a lot of conflict resolution, especially in business environments. Um, but one of the things that I wanted you to see about this is you'll notice the yellow arrow that goes across the bottom, okay? Determining what your response to conflict is, the, the greater sense of cooperation or what they call cooperativeness, um, you know, you, if, if you have people who are really willing to uh, cooperate uh, in working toward resolution, then you can use tools like accommodating and collaborating. Um, if you're not cooperating, um, you, you better stick on, on the, the means of dealing with conflict, avoiding or competing. Um, and I'm going to talk about each of those in a few minutes. Um, likewise, um, the more assertive um, individuals are in dealing with conflict, um, the uh, more that you should use uh, the, the form, the modes of, of dealing with conflict at the top of the chart, competing and collaborating. Um, if we get into any sort of um, conflict resolution in your co congregation over a specific issue and, and I'm brought in to help you, we're gonna look at this um, uh, particular slide again and I will unpack it even further. Um, this is a chart. Um, that I have created um, and it's, I wanna explain the chart uh, because again, if you're, if you're gonna be intentional about working on conflict resolution, 
Uh, this provides a very helpful uh, vocabulary um, for people uh, to deal with conflict. Uh, these uh, are not my uh, original thoughts. These were actually uh, generated by a well-known consultant whose name is Speed Lees uh, with the Alban Institute. And um, most of his material is, is available um, and his conflict stuff is second to none, uh, but it's, it's not really easily accessible. So uh, this is kind of a, a cheater helper chart that I created um, that, uh, again, you can stick in your uh, vestry notebook and uh, pull out to, to remind you uh, what's going on. Um, the first thing that I, I want you to note um, is at the very bottom of the chart is what I call ostrich mentality. Um, uh, in, in analyzing um, conflict, uh, there are many people who, uh, you know, they might, there may be uh, depression, uh, they may just be extremely conflict averse, um, but, uh, you know, they just don't see that there's a problem, okay? These are going to be people who are unwilling to address it in, in any shape, manner, for fashion. And if, if they know um, that you're going to be dealing with something at a vestry meeting and they get the agenda ahead of time, uh, they're going to be conveniently unavailable that, that evening. Um, so I, I just wanted to tag that. But we're going to be dealing with... Uh, Notice in the middle, the numbers zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, that I, I put down as, as a zero. So I'm not gonna talk about that again in this chart. Um, in levels one and two uh, of disagreement um, or conflict, uh, these are things that you can typically deal with uh, in house. Um, you don't really need an outside uh, person to come in and be a mediator or moderator. Um, these are low levels of conflict. Um, if there's a problem to solve, um, you can use collaboration, try and seek a win-win. You can use consensus. Um, this is the way a lot of, you know, day in and day out decisions get made on the vestry. Um, please note that I'm on the left side, left hand side of the number column. I'm talking about individuals, between individuals right now. We'll talk about systems in just a moment. Um, but uh, in these lower levels of conflict, uh, like level one, uh, there's a problem to solve, uh, or even into level two disagreements. Um, you can use collaboration, consensus. Um, uh, you can choose to support, um, uh, you know, something, even if you're not 100% in favor of it uh, for the good of the group, or uh, you can actually be playful um, in uh, resolving uh, the dispute. Um, I've actually seen people say, well, um, I'll give you this one, but I get I get the next win. Um, these are all lower levels of disagreement or conflict. Uh, they're typically around um, differing perspectives. Okay, the thing that you want to watch is um, when this disagreement shifts from being about issues or problems, and it becomes personal and people start attacking people, not ideas, but people. Um, and uh, you will see uh, one of the key words to watch for is always. Well, you always do that. You always think that, okay. You have just shifted from, you know, a problem to solve or disagreement 
it's now become personal. Um, you, this, you're entering into the contest level. Um, you can't use collaboration and consensus. You, you can't just, you know, when it shifts into that uh, category, you can't just say, oh, you know, let's pray about it. Look, you know, let's all get along. Um, once it shifts into contest, where somebody wants somebody to win and somebody wants somebody to lose, um, collaboration and consensus are not good tools to use. What you can do is shift to accommodating or negotiating or fact gathering. Um, those will be helpful skills when you start seeing it get into um, uh, the contest realm. Uh, the next escalation of conflict, uh, we've all been there. Level four, uh, fight or flight. Uh, we we got to duke this out or somebody's got to leave. Um, what you want to do in this uh, level of conflict is you have to find some safety zones. You, you have to kind of find some some caves to crawl in while the while the um, uh, ammunition is being lobbed at, at each other. Um, what are some safe structures um, that we can use during this period? Um, shuttle dis diplomacy is a uh, often used word in, in conflict resolution where it says, we're, we're going to look at one side and, and try and, and look, make some minor wins. And then we're going to look at another side and, and we're going to look at, you know, why they think this way. Um, the goal in fight flight is to de-escalate the conflict. It's not to resolve it. It's not to fix it. All you need to do is try and ramp it down so you can start using accommodation and negotiation in the, the contest world. But if uh, we switch from conventional weaponry uh, to nuclear <laughs> uh, weaponry, um, uh, that's when you get to an intractable si situation. Um, you know, the goal at this point is to just stop people from hurting one another and uh, sometimes the most effective way to do that is to move for adjournment um, in the vestry meeting. And I don't care if it's five minutes after you got there. Um, you know, if, if you see this heading into the nuclear battlefield, um, the goal, remember the appropriate goal in an intractable situation is minimize the wounds. Um, uh, obviously, uh, with dealing with individual conflict, uh, the goal is always to ramp the uh, rhetoric down so you can deal with it in a more constructive manner. Um, that deals with individual conflict, but I also want you to know that Speedly's also looks at conflict not just from an individual perspective, but also systems. Um, many of our, our current clergy are trained in uh, what's called systems theory, where um, we don't look at necessarily uh, individual problems, but we look at systems that have come into conflict with each other. Um, so if you're dealing with a situation of a system let's say like a vestry and a school board, okay? You're gonna to have to use some different tools um, when systems collide. Um, and uh, since we're talking about clergy vestry conflict, we're really more on the individual level, but I did want you to have this so you could see that um, similar tools are useful when dealing with conflict if you're on a system um, basis versus an individual basis. 
Um, and just to highlight uh, one thing, once you get to level three or above on a system level, somebody's leaving. Um, you're, you're more than likely not gonna recover, be able to recover uh, when systems are in significant conflict uh, unless somebody leaves. Um, few thoughts on conflict. Um, quality of our lives depends not on whether or not we have conflicts, but on how we respond to them. Max Lucado, one of my favorite uh, authors, conflict is inevitable, but combat is optional. Um, and if you want a more worldly perspective, Indira Gandhi, you can't shake hands with a clenched fist. Uh, these are uh, some breakdowns on how we work toward resolving conflict. And again, you have to make sure that this tool is appropriate to the level of conflict that you're dealing with. Um, in collaborating, there is a willingness to work together uh, that will hopefully develop a win-win situation. Uh, this uh, process promotes assertiveness. You want to hear a lot of people making I statements rather than you statements. This is appropriate when the, the decision or the situation is not urgent. Uh, if it's an important decision that needs to be made, um, where the conflict involves a large number of people or uh, people across two uh, groups or teams, and um, if previous conflict resolution attempts have failed. Collaborating is going to be a widely used method in many levels of conflict. If you need an urgent decision or if it's a, a trivial matter, don't, don't use your collaboration skills um, because they're not going to be effective. Uh, the competitive approach, um, when the person in conflict takes a firm stand, they're competing with the other party for power. Uh, they typically win, um, again, unless they're coming across someone against someone else who's competing. This style is often uh, analyzed by aggressive uh, response. It causes other people to feel injured or stepped on. Um, when decisions need to be made quickly, um, you know, one party is going to exert force over another one. Uh, I don't care how they get to the hospital, they're going now. You know, um, uh, it's appropriate when there's an unpopular decision. Uh, that needs to be made. Um, uh, one church was having a, a massive uh, fight over the right one, right two battle. Um, and I said, well, there are two very common ways that many congregations deal with this. Uh, one, they have right one at eight o'clock all the time. And one, they have right two at the 10 o'clock service all the time. And um, when they do have the occasions where they need to uh, have a joint service, um, there's a, a calendar kept and it's right one at nine o'clock one time and the next time it's right two. Or there are some congregations that use right one in Lent and Advent at all the services. More appropriate, they're it's a more penitential service and they use right to at other times um, and the vestry kind of looked at me dumbfounded and finally somebody said uh, we've never thought of that um, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up uh, this style is not appropriate when people are feeling sensitive about the conflict or the situation isn't urgent. 
compromise, another uh, widely used tool in conflict resolution, uh, each person gives up a little bit. Um, if as long as you are moving toward uh, conflict, conflict resolution, it does not work when only one party gives anything up. This is a great form to use in uh, conflict resolution. Uh, if a decision needs to be made sooner rather than later, it's, it's important, but it's not urgent. Um, resolving the conflict is more important than having each individual win. And power between people in the conflict is equal. Um, this, you know, in, in a vestry rector relationship, the power isn't really equal. Um, there may be minor decisions where it, it could be, but typically if it's rector vestry, um, there's gonna be an imbalance of power. So compromise is more than likely not gonna be your go-to um, uh, for generic conflict. Um, this style is not appropriate when there's a wide variety of important needs that need to be met or if a situation is urgent, or if, as I said, there's an imbalance of power. Um, accommodating um, is a very passive conflict resolution style. Please note, I did not say passive aggressive. Um, uh, accommodating is the style in which um, one of the parties in the conflict gives up so that the other party can have what they want. Um, uh, a, a good example of this um, in my household is um, uh, we, we don't go out to eat that much, especially in the COVID season. Uh, but when we do go out, um, my wife hates to make decisions about where we, what restaurant we go to. And uh, she hates to make decision about food. Um, she doesn't really care what she eats as long as she gets to eat. And typically when we have dinner, we eat, we don't dine. So she doesn't care. So uh, one of the ways, I know all that after 47 years, is I can say to her, um, well, how about Mexican? Are you okay with that? Or you want to go to Texas Roadhouse or uh, you want to grab something from Chick-fil-A? Um, okay, the question I don't ask is, where do you want to go have dinner? So my way of not generating conflict in that situation is I ask the question correctly that accommodates what I know about the other person. So let's think about that in terms of like a vestry uh, rector situation, okay? If you know that your rector is conflict averse, that really hates conflict, okay? One of the ways that you on the vestry can be accommodating of that is to say, let's choose our battles, okay? We really want to maintain this relationship. We have a good, healthy relationship with the rector. We, we like them as a people. We think they're doing a good job, okay? It's more important that we maintain the relationship than we win the battle. Um, and the issue at hand is very important to the other person, but it's not that important to you, okay? Um, uh, again, sit silly thing to me, um, are we gonna use palm fronds or are we gonna make palm crosses and hand them out this year? Well, in the COVID guidelines, if you're using COVID um, uh, guidelines from March 1st, um, you can make the little palm crosses if you want, but <clears throat> for distribution, you need to put them in individual plastic bags. So um, I was at a church not too long ago and they were having this discussion 
And as soon as they had heard that they had to put them in little plastic bags, they said, we're doing the fronds, forget it. <clears throat> okay, well, that was an accommodating uh, behavior. Keep in mind that accommodation will not permanently solve the problem. But again, these tend to be more minor issues where uh, accommodation is used. And then we have avoidance. Um, and there are times when avoidance is actually the healthy choice to deal with something. Uh, you may want to avoid the conflict entirely. Uh, people who use this as their default style of dealing with conflict um, tend to accept decisions without question, avoid confrontation, and delegate difficult decisions and tasks to others. Avoiding is a passive means of approach. It's not usually effective, but it does have its uses. This style is appropriate when the issue is trivial or the conflict will resolve itself on its own soon. The style is not appropriate when the issue is important to you or those close to you and the conflict will continue to get worse without attention. So if that's when you choose to avoid conflict instead of a means of resolving it, you are actually going to accelerate it. Um, I put this in uh, to this training um, just to clarify a few misconceptions. Um, most people know that uh, the rector does have tenure um, once they're hired, um, but uh, there are times uh, when uh, things happen either in the rector's life or in the congregation's life uh, where the rector um, does need to go. Um, this is usually a last um, uh, ditch response. Um, but I do want you to know that there is a means uh, in uh, Title III, Section 14 and 15, about how you deal with um, disagreements. Uh, and I did want to let you know that. Um, uh, the vestry or the rector, and this can only happen after there's been a majority vote of the vestry, may petition in writing for the bishop to intervene and assist to resolve the disagreement. Notice it's not, you write the letter, they're out the door. Uh, EA simply uh, is a means of shorthand ecclesiastical authority. It's normally the bishop, but if there were not a bishop, the ecclesiastical authority could be the standing committee or another appointed person. So the, the goal, again, is to resolve the disagreement. Uh, the bishop uh, will likely appoint a consultant or a licensed mediator. Um, the rector um, may not resign without consent of the vestry, and no rector may be removed against the rector's will. There is one exception that I've so noted, and you can look it up. I do want to let you know that after, after I, I prepared this, and I will fix it on the handout, um, if, the, if the rector is going to be removed against the rector's will, I should put a string of dollar signs out there. Because typically, when you get to that point, um, the, the vestry is going to decide to, to buy them out of their contract and it will be expensive. Um, in most situations, you should expect that it will be a minimum of six to 12 months of full salary and benefits. Um, next step, uh, the mediation and consultant services may be involved, 
the bishop may appoint uh, one clergy and one lay person to interview the rector and vestry and fact finding. This is to prepare a report for the bishop. The bishop may issue a godly judgment after they consult with the standing committee. Um, if there is any uh, pushback um, on the part of the, the rector, you know, the rector doesn't want to go or whatever, they can request a conference be held with the standing committee to review uh, the situation. Um, and the standing committee can make reservations and uh, recommendations. And then finally, if the clergy are not, not compliant with the bishop, there are further penalties and sanctions that may ensue. Um, this is in the National Canons, page 149 to 153. Uh, but again, please keep in mind, this is extreme situations. And um, uh, either the bishop or myself or some other designated person will be brought in long before you get to this, this point. Um, I want you to know that it is a canonical possibility uh, however, highly unlikely. <clears throat> that ends uh, our clergy um, uh, vestry conflict sec section. Um, if any of you have any questions, uh, you may enter them in the chat feature. Um, but if not, uh, we will move on to uh, clergy compensation guidelines. In the Diocese of Central Florida, each year um, there is posted on the diocesan website uh, a, a paper. This is actually just the top of it uh, that speaks about clergy compensation guidelines uh, for the coming year. You can look at your average Sunday attendance as reported by your parochial report and you can look at the years of credited service um, according to the church pension fund. And uh, this is just a, a broad spectrum uh, compensation guideline. There is actually on the next slide, you'll see there's one for each year of credited service. So what this basically means is that if you are an ordained Episcopal clergy person working full time in the Diocese of Central Florida, our guideline for what your salary should be up to 100 ASA uh, in 2021 is 66,000. Now this 66,000, you'll notice down here these numbers include the stipend or salary, and I'll talk about the difference between those in just a moment, plus the housing allowance. This is not a separate number, but it is included in that 66,000, plus the SICA, which is also included in the 66,000. So clergy don't are not, the guideline is not that you give them 66,000, then you give them a housing allowance. And then on top of that, you give them 0.0765 for half of their social security and Medicare. <coughs> on the contrary, the 66,000 includes all of those numbers. Uh, let me explain the difference between a stipend and a salary. Technically, clergy are normally, <coughs> or at least historically, given a stipend. This is, we're going to pay you for the month ahead. Stipends typically are paid at the beginning of the month um, for you to afford um, your food, gas, all, you know, whatever um, insurance, house payment, 
rent payment, whatever. Um, stipend is given at the beginning of the month. Now, um, it's not like, you know, we work so many hours and then we compensate you for those hours. Salary is typically given at the end of the month for the work that has been done previously. Um, many young clergy, people just getting out of seminary, um, we need to keep in mind, most are poor, uh, they're getting out of seminary, they have to either buy or rent a house, they have to come up with first, last, and damage, they have to pay, you know, all their normal, you know, household bills, and if they're getting out of seminary where they've not had a salary, um, and they're coming to work, they're going to be there for a month before they get a penny, or in some cases, two weeks. Um, so some churches have shifted to a stipend basis, and that just means that the clergy are paid in advance. There just needs to be a designation made on the clergy payroll so that when they leave, let's say at the end of the month, five years from now, that you're not having to give them an additional paycheck because they are receiving their paycheck in advance. If you choose not to do that and pay them at the end of the month or twice a month at the end of each pay period, then obviously that doesn't apply. Please note these are guidelines. You do not have to meet these numbers. But if you are not meeting these numbers, you do need to, to negotiate bo both with the clergy and notify the bishop um, that you are not in compliance with this. Um, I just wanted to let you know these numbers are for rectors only. If you are an assistant, these numbers don't apply other than this column, okay? So if you're an assistant in a church of 100 ASA and you have five years experience, okay, you should be bumped up a little bit above the 66,000, but your numbers are gonna be more in line with this list. Um, uh, if you're an assistant. Um, I did want to let you know that each year um, there is a report given to me by the church pension group uh, so I can look at how many clergy are actively paying into or their churches are actively paying into the pension fund and what the base salary that they are being paid at. And uh, in uh, 2020, uh, we have 90 clergy whose congregations are actively making pension payments. Uh, I thought it would be interesting for you to know that 24 of those clergy who are, whose congregations are paying into the pension fund get less than $66,000. We have um, between um, uh, 60 and 65,000, um, there are 10 people. Um, these are typically in congregations where they, the clergy have been there for a few years and the uh, clergy compensation has increased, uh, but um, their salary has not increased. So either the church budget has not enabled them to, to raise their pay, or at least not raise it at the recommended rate uh, that the diocese suggests. So right now we have 24 clergy who are below uh, these guidelines, 24 out of the 90. We have only three clergy who make exactly 66,000 um, but uh, just for, for grin's sake, um, of the 90 clergy, 
21 of them their uh, compensation, that is just salary, housing, and SECA, is over 100,000. And curiously, we have two rectors that actually make more than the bishop. Um, so I thought you might find that interesting. <clears throat> um, let me go back one slide. Um, you'll notice right here, um, the, um, uh, this is where you can find this uh, clergy compensation guideline on the um, diocesan website. Um, I would uh, remind you at this point uh, that this, uh, the link to this presentation, as well as all of the handouts um, and PowerPoint for uh, Vestry Training 1 and Vestry Training 2 this year are on the website and available for your use. Um, after that uh, previous guideline, here is a guideline for all of the years of credited service. Well, not all, but I think up to 30. And so you can see how incrementally you work toward that uh, based on years of service. And this years of service, credited years of service, occurs on the clergy uh, church pension group uh, printout. So if anyone has any question about what the years of credited service are, um, that um, is not what the clergy says it is, um, but it's actually what's reported on the church pension fund um, uh, annual statement. Also, uh, you will see that there is uh, a chart about what it actually costs for health insurance. Um, here we have a chart that talks about the cost of the high deductible, or HDHP stands for the high deductible health plan. The single coverage for just a single clergy or a church that only pays for single health coverage is 10,296. If you have a clergy person plus a spouse, the insurance cost for that is 20,592 a year. If you have a single clergy with uh, dependent children, um, the premium for that is 18,528. Um, and if your church is providing um, family insurance, the cost for that is 30,888. Uh, some clergy choose to use uh, the high deductible health plan option. And in that case, the costs are listed um, in these various columns. But please note, there's a, an employer, a church contribution to the HSA that goes along with that. So there is actually parity year by year, depending on what level of coverage that you provide. Since 2012, the Episcopal Church has required uh, parity between clergy and lay employees. So since 2012, most of our congregations have opted to only provide um, health insurance at the single level coverage of the diocesan standard plan. The choice to provide uh, spouse insurance, uh, employee plus children level of insurance, or family insurance is left up to each individual congregation. Um, you should make it clear um, to the search committee if you're in search 
what level of insurance coverage that you are willing to provide because it will um, either include or exclude um, several candidates. Uh, this, uh, again, you have the, the link where you can actually go to and find this link. But if you have a clergy that, uh, full-time clergy that is um, hired um, and you are only covering the clergy person for health insurance, this is the minimum cost to the parish notice uh, 66,000, the, the salary, SE employment offset and housing allowance, um, the um, health insurance cost, the pension, uh, 18%. Um, uh, if you have any question about these numbers, Earl Pickett will be happy to run them for you. Uh, basic cost of dental insurance, um, accountable reimbursement for business miles driven. This year it's 56 cents a mi uh, mile for business miles, um, continuing education. Um, and so here is your cost for uh, single full-time uh, clergy. Uh, cost for employee plus spouse, employee plus children, and employee plus family coverage. So when churches are working out their budgets, uh, these should be the minimum numbers that they use depending upon the insurance level of coverage that's provided. Um, I also want to throw in here um, that there are uh, specific rates set aside for supply clergy. And again, these are guidelines. Uh, but what I say to people is if you don't pay this, these rates, don't be surprised if you have difficulty finding people to do it next time you need a supply priest. Um, one Sunday service with sermon, 175. Two Sunday service with sermons, 225. One midweek service, no sermon, 75. Um, I do also want to let you know that um, this will be adjusted um, in speaking with the bishop. We have several congregations who do not have a uh, regular clergy person on call. And so we are adding uh, to this compensation of supply clergy. If one of those congregations contacts a clergy person who's not regularly assigned there to do pastoral care, last rites, visitation for them, um, we are going to be including a new figure here for um, pastoral care um, of a differing congregation. And that I believe is going to be $60 plus mileage. Um, when uh, vestries talk about total compensation, um, they are talking about everything that's on this list. When clergy talk about compensation, they're typically talking about what's in the red. So it's important that you understand uh, what you're talking about. Uh, in several of the congregations that um, their clergy have recently uh, left to take another job, uh, they were working with the search committee and the vestry to come up with the compensation. And what they have been doing is let's say the the previous uh, salary uh, guideline was 65,000. Well, they were doing 65,000 plus a housing allowance plus SICA, okay? What SICA is, is a self-employment compensation adjustment for clergy taxes 
there are certain parts of clergy salary that are non-taxed, that is the housing allowance, um, but there are certain items that we do have to pay self-employment, uh, um, social security and Medicare. And so the SECA is half of the um, required um, uh, rates for social security and Medicare. Um, that is added to the pension uh, when you're figuring out the pension um, uh, assessment, um, that gets added to the total number. Um, another thing that I wanna talk about is there's a great deal of incongruity uh, across the diocese about how clergy compensation is reported in the budget. Um, budget example number one, uh, some um, congregations uh, put just a single line item, like example number one, uh, this is our total clergy cost, okay? Well, that's what ac people actually think the clergy are, are living on, uh, when in actuality, um, over a third of that uh, does not occur in their uh, check register. Uh, we recommend in terms of budget reporting uh, to the congregation, uh, example two. So you have the rector's salary plus uh, half of the SECA tax reimbursement. And you'll see that comes up to roughly um, the 66,000 um, minimum uh, clergy salary. Uh, what the cost of health insurance, this is, this is actually from a different diocese. This isn't ours, but just using this as an example. So you can put out health insurance, pension assessment, continuing education, um, and uh, understand that that communicates to the parish that the wages are what the clergy are living on and all the other benefits. Um, while they're benefits, they're actually not a part of his monthly paycheck. So um, accurately communicating to the parish, um, clergy compensation, um, that's, that's a big issue. So if you have any question about that and want some guidelines, Again, uh, you can either email me or Earl Pickett, and we're more than happy to help you with that. Um, before we leave clergy compensation, are there any other questions that folks may have? And you can do that either in the chat feature or by unmuting your microphone. Okay, Scott, I've got a one. Okay. Does uh, years of service include seminary time? No, it does not. No, thank you. Yep. Canon, uh, I have a question as it relates to housing. Okay. Where does that appear in example number two? Okay, let me go back to that just a second. Um, keep in mind, housing is not a, um, it, it's right here with salary. Because uh, again, okay. keep, keep in mind, the housing allowance is uh, simply a designation uh, on the part of the clergy about that part of their compensation that they can justify for their taxes um, 
that they want to be excluded from um, their W-2. So it, at least on the, on the wages part of it, um, it does appear on the W-2 down further on the, on the uh, uh, benefit side. But um, this is not a, a separate um, line item. Salary and housing are one number. And then uh, the half of the SECA is 0.0765 times that number. See, clergy have to pay 15.3% of their total compensation as social security. So the church paying half of it right here um, is more equitable because then uh, they are uh, they have a similar uh, benefit as do other employees. But these two numbers are a part of the diocesan guidelines. The diocesan guidelines that you saw here, okay, notice they include stipend or salary, housing, and SICA. Mm -hmm. Okay. So SICA is not on top of this. And we have several churches that have actually been doing that. They thought this was just salary and housing, and then they were paying the clergy an additional 0.0765% um, uh, on top of that. And so many of them were very surprised when they learned they didn't have to do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, another question that has come up. What if your rector is part-time? Let me ask, answer that first. Um, if your rector is part-time, um, you have more than likely worked out a uh, salary or a compensation guideline with that person. Um, I just hope that the job description or the material included in the letter of agreement represents the salary. Uh, we, have, we have churches in the diocese that use the standard letter of agreement for a full-time clergy, but then pay the clergy a fractional percent of the salary. So I would just say, if, if your rector is other than full-time, there should be specific items listed in the letter of agreement that you do not expect the clergy to deal with. Um, you can't expect full-time work when you're only paying them a fractional uh, part of their compensation. Um, if your rector is, um, what are the retirement recommendations? Okay, if your clergy, um, let's say if, if you have a clergy who, whether they are a deacon or a priest or a bishop, and they are receiving compensation. It doesn't matter if that compensation even is for uh, being the parish administrator, okay? You still have to pay 18% pension assessment if it's an ordained person and receiving compensation of any kind from the church, you still have to pay a pension assessment on that um, salary. So for example, of the 90 um, clergy who are currently paying into the pension fund 
or whose churches are paying into the pension fund, uh, several of them are deacons and they are being paid um, in some cases from being a parish administrator or some other function. But any compensation from the church to an ordained Episcopal clergy, bishop, priest, or deacon has to be uh, covered by the pension fund. Okay, are there any other questions about compensation? I just do wanna say one last thing, and that is if your clergy persons are um, significantly below this chart, um, I do hope that you will have a discussion with them about ways that uh, the congregation is going to be working or at least trying to establish a goal uh, to bring them up to uh, the diocesan guidelines. Okay. Um, we are doing pretty good uh, time-wise. Um, many people have asked the question, uh, what's it gonna look like after COVID? And uh, as varying dioceses throughout the country are starting to um, loosen uh, guidelines up, ours have, have loosened up significantly um, in the uh, March 1st version of the COVID guidelines. Um, but we see um, all of the dioceses and the canons to the ordinary or people who are responsible for the COVID guidelines. We actually submit these to a, a database on the national church uh, for the national church. And so we're actually able to go in and look at what other people's guidelines are um, as well as CDC and, and other things. Um, most of our guidelines for COVID response for children and the guidelines for children or schools uh, are coming from either the Episcopal Camp and Conference Center website or the Episcopal Schools website. So um, we have taken a, um, I think a very uh, responsible approach um, and we've, we've provided guidelines that the bishop has approved um, throughout this pandemic. And we expect that uh, that will continue uh, as vaccines uh, increase. Uh, I would say uh, to you all that uh, I think it will be a while before our next um, revision of the COVID-19 rules. Um, believe it or not, uh, many clergy and uh, future studies people are actually starting to think, plan, dream about uh, what life is going to be like um, after COVID. Um, for those of you who heard the president's speech the other night, uh, they're hoping that by May 1st, uh, the vaccine will be uh, accessible to all, whether it will be available is a different issue, but uh, many of the guidelines uh, are uh, broadening up um, very quickly. So one thing that we know, however, is that the church is going to be different. Um, first of all, um, after the pandemic, um, at least the, the, the group gatherings gather, um, we're going to be having lots of funerals because there are many people who have delayed uh, celebrations of life or funeral until after that time. So one thing that I want to say about church being different is at least initially 
uh, we are going to be having lots of funerals um, and similar services. Um, I do think that this um, delay is also affecting people's grief process. And so I hope uh, clergy and church members, as we regather, may remember that um, people will still be grieving even though their spouse may have died uh, many months ago. Um, our congregations will be comprised of some folks who have connected online that we've never met in person. Uh, some of you know my son is a priest in Colorado Springs and he arrived at the congregation he's serving now, St. Michael the Archangel, uh, 45 days before the COVID-19 shutdown. So uh, there are many people who were away uh, when he arrived uh, last January. Um, and uh, literally, uh, they've been attending, supporting a part of their church, but they've never met their rector in person. So there are going to be some, some strange guidelines um, or at, at least we need to be sensitive that there are also going to be people who have been following you online that are now going to be able to join you in person. And they're like, oh, you're new. Well, no, I've been, I've been on the Zoom uh, link and I've been worshiping with you for some time. Um, so exactly what's defining a congregation uh, is going to be different. Um, uh, the church has a golden opportunity to um, help people uh, reconnect with society through worship, through fellowship guidelines. And we really need to encourage the vestry and clergy to provide a wide variety of fellowship options, keeping in mind that people are not going to be comfortable with large group gatherings for some time. So uh, you may need to have multiple small Bible studies instead of one big large class, or uh, even in our outreach ministries. Uh, many of the things that we used to do even though people may have gotten their shots and, and vaccines, um, they're gonna be slow to regather um, in larger groups. Um, the church is gonna need to provide guidelines um, and really model that we know this is tough for you, um, but we're glad you're here. Um, I heard the other day someone say, I am so glad that, you know, we're now start, starting to talk about a post COVID world because that means I'm never going to have to use Zoom again. Uh, on the contrary, uh, Zoom is here to stay. It's introduced a new world of technology that helps us to connect with people. And I hope rather than thinking about cutting it down, that you will think about even further expanding uh, your Zoom and online presence. Uh, many congregations have actually grown during this COVID time. Um, and many people who are connecting online uh, are filling out pledges and financially supporting uh, these ministries. So I really hope that um, you are not planning on scrapping uh, your virtual or online presence. Uh, if you have been limping along and not, you know, thinking about buying new technology or investing in computers or cameras or whatever, um, please, please, please reconsider that option. And uh, we do have resources in the diocese. Um, Father Rob Goodridge, um, retired uh, rector of um, 
St. Gabriel's in Titusville, uh, now serving as interim at uh, St. Augustine of Canterbury, uh, worked in TV production uh, before going to seminary and is uh, a great resource. Um, Eric Guzman, the diocesan communication director, uh, can put you in touch with people who can come in and look at your system and how you do uh, online uh, worship, whether it's Facebook Live or YouTube or Vimeo or whatever your platform is, um, please, please, please consider um, continuing to improve and enhance that. Um, there are many uh, people uh, who have also um, forewarned us uh, that even if the church were to reopen tomorrow, it's not going to be the same old thing. Worship isn't going to look like it used to look. Um, our, our churches, our congregation, even our styles are going to be um, challenged. So the vestry and clergy need to be thinking creatively and imaginatively about how they're going to do this. Um, I can tell you the thought of going to drive in church was absolutely the farthest thing from my mind that I thought I as a civilized Episcopalian would ever do. Um, I actually did it and I enjoyed it. Um, I've, I've been to uh, services online where I hopped in my car and rode a half hour uh, to, you know, stand in line to receive communion. Um, uh, we're all doing things that we've never thought we'd do before, but rather than let's go back and do it exactly the way we used to do it, um, I hope that you will set aside some time in your vestry meetings to think creatively and imaginatively about uh, restarting the church after COVID. Um, Technology is not going away. Um, um, one of the complaints that I've heard by many clergy, especially in our smaller congregations, is that the vestry and the people in the church have expected the clergy to be responsible for making sure the technology works. Um, they're not gonna be able to do that. As churches open up, the responsibilities and the weight on clergy shoulders is going to uh, ramp up exponentially and they cannot be the ones responsible for uh, actually seeing that the technology takes place or is working correctly. So if you haven't developed a tech team or even hired, you know, you can hire teenagers uh, to come in and do this. Uh, this is the world they live in. Um, you're way behind the curve. So please include technology and technology support um, in your uh, budget for the next year. We also need to be realistic that some people may never return to in-person worship, whether they get their shots or not. Um, and so we are encouraging uh, clergy to start training um, more lay Eucharistic visitors. Um, consider uh, looking at Stephen's ministries or other ministries that enhance one-to-one um, -one contact with your homebound people. Uh, use your OSL uh, people uh, to help with that. Um, some people just aren't going to return. And so um, we need to think about how we're going to connect with them in a meaningful way um, 
uh, as we move into this post-COVID period. Um, many churches um, for decades have had small groups. Um, if your church has not had small groups, um, I would encourage you to right now start looking into uh, how you could do that or is this an option uh, for our congregation because many churches that have existing small group ministries are already at a significant advantage. Um, we already talked about investing in video equipment. Um, we also need to be realistic that some churches um, after the pandemic is over and they discover the real impact of this pandemic on the church um, that they may no longer uh, be able to exist. Um, again, ministry to the homebound will need to be significantly increased. Um, Bishop Brewer is committed to providing uh, ongoing COVID-19 safeguards uh, for all people throughout the Diocese of Central Florida. This will include our Camping Conference Center, uh, uh, Camp Wingman, um, Canterbury. Um, they are very much aware of diocesan guidelines, our Episcopal schools. Uh, we will continue to provide guidelines um, that we hope that everyone is abiding by. Um, this uh, is not the time to drop our guard or be inconsistent about ensuring the safety and health of our worshipers. Um, there's a great deal of misinformation that's circulating. Oh, I've heard now that I have my vaccine, I don't have anything to worry about. Um, you know, can we start having services that are, you know, vaccine free? I mean, that everyone who attends this service has had their vaccine. Uh, all we need to do is bring our vaccine uh, card and prove that we've been vaccinated and then we don't have to wear masks or any of that sort of stuff. I just want you to be aware that the current CDC guidelines uh, are very clear that it is not, it has not been proven that uh, even if you have had a vaccine and waited the appropriate period of time that you cannot trans be a carrier or a transmitter of the uh, coronavirus aerosolized droplets. So until we have those guidelines, uh, the mask uh, rules will continue uh, for children or individuals over 16 years of age or older. Um, again, we continue to monitor the guidelines of CDC. The presiding bishop's office also puts out COVID guidelines, Florida Department of Health, uh, ECC guidelines um, during this COVID season. Um, uh, let's see, we have a question. Um, under 16 do not need masks. Um, in the March 1st COVID guidelines, uh, we did say that um, according to the Episcopal Church, you know, those who can vote um, in uh, parish elections, uh, 16 years of age or older, uh, that is implying, uh, uh, you know, an adult decision-making ability, um, at least hopefully in most 16 year olds. Um, but that's why we chose the, the age of 16. Uh, anyone under 16, um, that decision is left to the discretion of the parents. Uh, but we do want to make sure that um, that question is at least raised um, by clergy, by leadership, so that there is a consistency across the diocese about that. So under 16, 
uh, is dependent on the instruction of the parents. Any other questions? Okay, um, we are right about 11.30. Um, uh, I've covered the, the primary material that I need to cover. Uh, what I do wanna say is that um, rather than have the, the once a year, five or six hour training, um, we have received good comments about having these short two hour blocks. Um, if there are other um, items that you would like um, for uh, me or someone on diocesan staff to offer to you, um, I would love to hear from you. Just email or call me, not today, um, but call me during the week. And uh, I'd be happy to uh, hear what um, ideas you have about ongoing training. Um, I think it is important that our vestry uh, people are trained uh, to uh, know not only what other churches are doing, what the canons say, but I'd much rather take an occasional Saturday morning or um, if evening trainings would be more helpful to you, uh, we can certainly do that. But all of our um, vestry training will um, be Zoom uh, recorded and uh, available um, at least for a reasonable amount of time. Um, but uh, if you have vestry members who were not able to come, uh, you'll be able to uh, click a link and listen to this Zoom training, uh, or you can certainly preview the um, PowerPoint and get the basics of what we've talked about. So that's why we're gonna continue to provide resources for you. Um, we're also looking at developing a vestry resource page on the website that will include things like mutual ministry reviews and, and other forms and uh, ideas that I think would be helpful. So um, we love nobody having to travel um, and uh, covering timely um, uh, matters in the church. And curiously, most of the things that uh, I have focused on in our vestry training have been because of recent problems in the church in, in some of our local congregations. So um, uh, I'm, I'm not picking subjects out of the air, but actually covering things that um, would have saved people a lot of grief had they uh, followed uh, some protocols. Uh, one of our deacons asked the question, does this training count for CE hours for clergy? It does. Um, and you can so note that on your uh, clergy continuing education report uh, when you turn it in at the end of the year. Thank you for joining our vestry training part two. If you have ad any additional ideas for vestry training or wish to share comments, questions, or concerns, uh, please uh, send them to me at my email address, sholcomb at cfdiocese.org. Uh, we will be preparing additional training um, subjects um, on video with PowerPoints. Uh, so you may want to check back from time to time. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, again, I would remind you 
that everything is available on um, the link to the videos, uh, the PowerPoints and notes that you can print off um, on the diocesan website. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, it is time for us to anticipate transitions. Before us lay difficult tasks, like drafting a budget, evaluating others and ourselves, and raising up new leadership. Help us to give these tasks our best energies and intentions, lest we wound in our haste and fail to see the people within the processes. Inspire in us a servant's heart. Inspire in us both candor and compassion. Inspire in us trust in you that can infect our congregation with hope. Help us to be more efficient, but even more help us to be effective. And even that, more than that, help us to be faithful. All this we ask in the name of one who chose common clay for disciples and then molded them into a glorious company of saints. Amen.